Good morning. Good morning. It's a way to get our attention. Yes. Welcome to New Baptist Church. It is a great morning to be together. Um, welcome to all those who have uh, started to thaw out and brave. Uh, hopefully, the snow's disappearing and we're getting back towards normal this week. I um, do want to invite you back uh, Wednesday evening. It looks like the forecast uh, says it should be warmer and roads should be more clear. And hopefully kids are going back to school this week. And we'll be back to having youth in Awana on Wednesday evening. Um, that uh, will start at 6 o'clock. And then uh, Bible studies at 6.30. So we invite you to be back and, and be a part of um, all of our services on Wednesday evening. Also wanted to let you know, um, ladies, we have a women's Bible study or women's Bible studies that are kicking off. Um, there are signups back in the back at the Welcome Center. And so um, please check those out and sign up. Um, I've been told uh, that they need to, uh, to, to get signups so that they can get books ordered. So if you would, um, please check those out uh, after the service and, and uh, sign up and get your book, books ordered and, and be ready to go for the women's Bible studies. Guys, um, you're not to be left out. On January 31st, uh, they are kicking off uh, the new men's Bible study. Um, it will meet every Wednesday, or no, meet on Wednesday mornings. Uh, the 31st will be the first morning. Um, they are uh, meeting at 7 a.m. at the McDonald's uh, by the stadium. So 7 a.m. McDonald's by the football stadium down on Fifth Avenue. Um, first meeting will be January the 31st. If you um, have more uh, questions about that, um, I think see Greg Creasy um, and, uh, or, or talk to, to Pastor Trent. You can get more information about that. Um, we do, uh, do want to celebrate the things that are, are, are uh, really important in the life of the church and, and want to recognize um, just the time that we spend in God's word. And so if you completed the Bible in 2023... Um, please let us know. You can uh, send a message to the church office. Um, you can also connect with our Connect card um, on the website and just let us know that you finished reading through the Bible in 2023. It, you didn't have to read it all in 2023. You just completed in 2023. Um, we'd love the opportunity of being able to recognize you. Um, and then finally, um, we have a church directory. It's an online church directory. It is, it's password protected, um, and only those that, that participate in our church are, are, are able to get access to that. Um, and you have to be in the directory to have access to the directory. So um, if you would like to be a part of that, you don't have to be a member of the church, just actively uh, worshiping and participating in the church. We would love to have you um, in there. It's, a, it's an easy way for us to be able to, to look um, quickly and, and uh, see people's pictures and their, their contact information. And um, just for us to care for one another inside this community, um, we want to, to have you a, a part of that. So um, you can reach out to, to Pat in the office or one of us uh, on staff and we'd love to, to help you um, to, to be able to, to get into the church directory and, and be a part of that. We are glad that you're here this morning. It's a great morning to be able to gather together, to be able to worship God together. As we begin our worship, I want to invite you to stand. Um, we have a, a new uh, scripture that we're memorizing this year. We are memorizing Psalm 19, and so we're starting with verse 1. Let's say it all together. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Let's join as we pray this morning. God, we thank you for this day. God, we, we thank you for your handiwork. We thank you for um, just the beauty that surrounds us. But God, also this community of people that you've created in your image um, to be able to come together and worship you together, to, to have this time where we can look to your word and, and see you revealed um, in truth and to understand your glory and to worship you. Um, God, this morning, um, we praise you and we thank you. And, and God, we come to worship you. Um, God, for those that, that bring um, heartaches or troubles or worries or sickness or pain, God, I, I pray that you will take those things. Um, and, and God, just allow us to, to be able to worship you in freedom this morning. God, we love you so much. And we, um, and we pray that you will be here among us. Um, that you, um, through your word and, and through your singing and, and the time that we spend together, um, just would be honored and praised. God, we pray all of these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Good morning. If you would, remain standing as we begin to worship this morning.
my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you scripture reading comes from Philippians chapter 2 and it's verses 1 through 4. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. This is God's word. Behind your grave. 
altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Bear your cross as you wait for the crowd. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Pray with me this morning. Dear Heavenly Father God, we come before you this morning. Hearts open and minds open for what you have to say. God, as Trent comes, allow us to hear him. And hear you through him. It's in your awesome and holy name we pray. Amen. You may see. We're going to take this moment just to uh, gather and pray together. Um, as we use the Lord's Prayer as kind of a template um, for our prayers together, um, we'll take some pauses and just take the moment to pray where you are. Um, let's gather and pray together. God, our Father, we are grateful for who you are, and we proclaim your goodness and your might, your majesty and holiness this morning. God, we pray that your kingdom come and your will be done um, in the service, um, God, in our lives, in our families, in our community, and in our world around us. We seek your will um, this morning. God, as we think about the things that you have provided for us, um, God, we um, depend upon you um, for every breath of air that we take, and God, every bite of food, um, God, for um, just a, a warm place to be, um, God, we, uh, we thank you for those things, and, and God, we um, confess the things that we have need for to you now. And God, now we lift up um, those uh, that are, are sick. Um, God, those that are, are hurting, um, that have lost um, loved ones. And God, those that are celebrating um, new births and new life. Um, God, um, for the, the many that um, are on our hearts and our minds. Um, God, the burdens that we carry. We offer these things to you. God, we want to take a moment just to say thank you um, for uh, th those that um, provide for um, the ministries of this church, um, God, in, in their talents and their gifts, um, God, in, in the, the offerings that they bring. God, we thank you um, uh, for, for the gifts that you've given us and the ability for us to share it um, so that we can be a blessing in this world. And God, now we, we confess our sins. Um, God, ways that we have failed you. Um, God, ways that we have failed others. Um, God, in the things that we have done. And, and God, in the things we've just left undone. Um, we confess these things to you. And God, we are grateful that you forgive us. And in the same kind of way, we extend that forgiveness to others. And 
in our hearts right now, we extend that forgiveness. We need you this morning, God. Um, we need you to guide us, to protect us, to, to, to lead us in paths and ways that are not our ways, but in your ways. And God, this morning, we, we lean all of our trust and our dependence on you. Um, God, as your word is open to us, um, reveal your truth. And God, as you walk with us and beside us and ahead of us, um, God, may we follow faithfully after you. Because we recognize that yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And we pray these things in Jesus' name.
Would you stand with me as we sing Day by Day, page 56, and we'll sing all three verses. to invite our children to please stand. It's time to dismiss them to Kids Church. Let's give them a round of applause as they go out. Go out. This year, between now and up to Easter, we will be in Matthew chapter 5 to chapter 7, a section of scripture that is called the Sermon on the Mount. It is the longest recorded sermon that we have of Jesus and is a message that I do believe Jesus preached multiple times in multiple places, parts of it or all of it. The interpretive key to the sermon by that I mean a summary of the sermon, how we are to understand the sermon is found one chapter prior. It's a summary statement as to what Jesus preached. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, we read that from that time Jesus began to preach saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is about. The word repent means to turn around to stop going in the wrong direction and start going in the right direction. 
people, unfortunately, understand the word to repent to simply mean feeling sad or grieving over sin. But true repentance means beyond a, going beyond a feeling to a change of life, turning from a path that leads to destruction and turning to a way that leads to life or turning from the ways of the world to turning to the ways of the kingdom. Thus, when Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he is saying that the road that the people of this world are traveling on leads to destruction. But there is a way that leads to life. The Sermon on the Mount is the kingdom way. And I want to be really clear here. We are saved by faith in Christ. We are saved by faith in Christ. But what does it look like to be saved? Well, the Sermon on the Mount is a description of what it looks like to be saved. It is a description of what it looks like to be a citizen of heaven. You're not saved by doing what the Sermon on the Mount says for you to do. But when you are saved by faith, this is who you become. It describes who we are as citizens. As an illustration, my mother is an immigrant from Canada. Her father, my grandfather, is an immigrant from the Ukraine. And both of them, in becoming citizens of a new country, had to meet certain expectations of citizenship. My grandfather had to learn a new language, learn a culture, find a job. And it was not so different for my mother when she became a citizen of the United States. It is like this when you become a Christian. In becoming a Christian, you become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And like any nation or kingdom, there is a culture. There is a way of life that you are expected to learn and to follow as a citizen. The Sermon on the Mount describes the culture of the kingdom. It describes what citizenship looks like. It describes what it looks like to no longer be walking in the ways of the world and now be walking in the way of the kingdom. Repent, Jesus says. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Last week, we looked at the introduction of the sermon as a summary point. We were in it last year briefly. And, and it's simply as a short summary, the first 20 verses, Jesus talks about we being blessed because Jesus the King has come. How are we blessed? Well, in him, ours is the kingdom of heaven. In him, we are comforted and, and, and content and are forgiven. And by him, we see God and are children of God. All of these blessings are ours through faith in the one who has fulfilled the law, Jesus, the Messiah. And because we are blessed, we are to be a blessing. We are to be salt and light to this world. That was our message last week. Today we will be looking at Matthew chapter 5, 21 to 26, a section, a, a, a section of the sermon that begins in many ways to define the culture of the kingdom. Let's begin with prayer. Gracious Father, I thank you for this morning. I ask um, not only your hand and your spirit upon us, upon me this morning as we open up your word, but I pray that you give us courage to hear your word, to, to, um, to embrace the culture of the kingdom, to listen to how you call us to live according to your ways, Father. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Some years ago, when my wife was doing her graduate studies in counseling, she introduced me to the work of John Gottman, a renowned psychologist who claimed to have the ability to predict the likelihood of divorce with a 90% accuracy within five minutes of simply observing how a husband and wife communicate with each other. His prediction method was based on what he called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. A very interesting title, especially since he is Jewish. 
In Gottman's structure, a horseman represents a way that people communicate. And if a particular horseman is present, it is a sign, it is a signal that there is an apocalypse coming. There's an end to the marriage. Here are his four horsemen. Number one, criticism. Criticism is, is different from complaint. Complaint is, I, 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 don't, I, I don't like the house being messy all the time. Criticism is, you're a slob. You're lazy. Criticism is an attack on a person's character. It's when, when, when a spouse will say to the other spouse things like, you're selfish. You only care about yourself. You never think of me and so on. Why, why, do you, why are you always late? You're, you're just, you're, just you don't, you're unreliable. Criticism is an attack on character. And then there is contempt. Contempt is criticism going up a, a notch. Contempt is, is, is the sense, looking at the spouse, that you actually have no value, that you're worthless. And this, and this arrogancy and pride comes out in words that tear down and wound, comes out in ridicule and in mocking and in name-calling and in mimicking behaviors and eye-rolling, right? It's a way to hurt and put down the other person. The third horseman, according to Gottman, is defensiveness. This takes place when a person takes no responsibility for any of their problems. Everything that's wrong in my life, everything that's wrong in my marriage is your fault. And if you try to complain or criticize or try to show me what's wrong, I'm going to turn it around and put it back on you. I will play the victim. I will shift the blame. I will point to you. You're to blame and not me. And finally, there is stonewalling. Stonewalling is a disengagement from the relationship. It is turning away. It is shutting down. It's refusing to actually engage in a meaningful way. If the spouse comes and says, hey, we need to talk about this, the other spouse will turn their back and says, no, I'm not going to talk about it. Walk away or disengage or not listen. There's a wall that's put up, stonewalling. These are the four horsemen that signal the coming apocalypse of a marriage, according to John Gottman. And the reason I am sharing these four horsemen of the apocalypse with you this morning is because that when I was first introduced to them by my wife, my mind jumped to our passage this morning, Matthew 21 to 25, 21 to 26. 2,000 years before John Gottman, Jesus said much the same thing regarding how we communicate except that he was not just talking about marriage. He was talking about all our relationships, school and work and family and church, how a person communicates can create dysfunctional and hurtful environments to the point that relationships are destroyed and hell itself is the consequence. That's Jesus speaking there. Ways of communicating that have absolutely no place in the kingdom of heaven, among the citizens of heaven. So with this, let's now turn to our scripture and read about these words that Jesus says, these are not for my people. These are not how we are to communicate as citizens. Verse 21. You've heard it that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you, notice his authority, I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Jesus does not have four horsemen of the apocalypse. He has three, and they are very close to the same. His three, again, are everyone who is angry, whoever insults, 
and whoever says, you fool. I'm going to look at each one of these in turn. The first one. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother is liable to judgment. The Greek word here for anger is orgizomenos. Orgizomenos. Actually, the word for root word for anger is orgi, rage. That's where we. That's where our word from rage comes from. It's a furious rage. But added to this word orgizo is a participle menos, and the participle is a present middle nominative participle, which you probably do not have a clue what I'm talking about. Because in English, we don't have middle participles. We don't, our brains don't even work that way. So let me explain how Jesus is using this word anger. In English, we have the active voice. I verbed you. I angered you. Or the passive voice. I am verbed by you. I'm angered by you. Well, the middle voice is this. It's very unique in Greek, and it's everywhere in Scripture. And the middle voice will go something like this. I verbed myself. I am angered by myself. Not I'm angered with myself. We do that all the time. I'm angered with myself for what I've done. But I am creating anger in me. Uh, So this means when Jesus says everyone who is angry with his brother, he's not talking about the type of anger that we should have over things like injustice and sin, but rather an anger we create in ourselves towards another person. It is the anger that is stirred up in one's heart when something happens in life that we don't like. Someone cuts in line, a misspoken word, someone doesn't do what I want. And so a person sits and stews and thinks and dwells and (coughs) and replays in the mind and heart all those things. And they create in themselves this bitterness, this anger, this frothing. This is the type of anger that Jesus says is, the, is, is, is equitable to murder, that destroys marriages, that destroys relationships in churches. And he says, not in my kingdom. You will not do this in my kingdom. Move on to the next word. It says, whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. I'm reading from the ESV. And that translation lets me down in this verse. Literally, the Greek reads, that word insult, really the Greek reads, the one who says raka to his brother will be liable to the Sanhedrin. And since we English speakers don't know what the word raka means, the ESV changed it to a generic insult. I think that was a mistake. The closest English word to the word raka are words like this. Rags, trash, garbage. To call someone raka is to say that they are worthless. They have no value, that they're a piece of dirt. It is a word that describes a heart that sees the other person with utter contempt and disdain and of no value. Jesus says, this does not belong in my kingdom. Our third word, Jesus says, whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. The Greek word here for fool is moros, the root word for our word moron. It means fool, idiot, stupid, dumb, lazy, dull, and so on. It's an attack on the character. It's it's criticism as Gottman would define it. The root word of moros has already been used once in our Sermon on the Mount. If you look back at at verse 13 of chapter 5 where it reads, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, moros. That's where that word is used there. If the salt has become dull and tasteless and lazy, it is to be thrown out. And this is what a person does when when he calls a person a fool. They throw them out. They, to call a person a moros, a fool, is to say that you are good for nothing. You have no value. And people do this today. 
I think, in my experience, when people are hypercritical to others with the goal of hurting the other person, of always finding fault, of always devouring the other person, of always speaking in such a way to deliver an insult, to deliver a blow, to turn that knife just a little bit. Do you know what I mean? There are some people that I know who have this amazing sinful ability to always turn the knife a little bit in every conversation. That when they talk, they let it be known that, that you're, you're never quite good enough. That, 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 that you don't quite meet up to expectations. That you're just a little bit of a failure and so on. I think James... Chapter 3, verse 6, describes such people really well. Peoples whose words discourage and destroy other people, whose tongues are set on fire by hell. That's what James says, their tongues are set on fire by hell. And just like those who stir up anger and hate in their own heart, and those who look, on, can, look at others with contempt and disdain, there is no place in the kingdom of heaven for those who discourage or destroy other people with their tongue. How clearly can Jesus say this? Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So let us summarize. A person who holds on to anger and bitterness towards other people, a person who thinks of themselves as better than others, or a person who is a discourager of others are illegal immigrants in the kingdom of heaven and will be cast out. They don't belong. But, but, those who confess their sin, those who take responsibility, those who seek reconciliation reflect the king and his kingdom. This is what Jesus says next. Moving on to verse 23. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and <coughs> excuse me, come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with the accuser while you're going with him to court. At least your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. The way of the world is defensiveness, to use John Gottman's, John Gottman's categories. The way of the world is to deny, 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 make excuses, shift blame, self-justify. The way of the world is to point a finger and say it's your fault, not me. But the way of the kingdom is to confess wrong done and to seek to make it right. In verse 23, we're given a picture of a person worshiping the Lord. And there as he worships, he remembers a wrong that he's done to another person. And, and I love this about, the, they're just a little, everything is full, it's everything's so full. This person doesn't remember the wrong until he worships. But as he worships, he remembers. And I think that's a gift from God. God gives to us in worship, through his spirit, a revealing to our souls of how we've hurt others. And upon that prompting, Jesus teaches that we are then in need to go and make it right with the one that we have hurt. In this life, in this world, we do things that hurt others. We all do. We do say words that are wrong. We all do. But a citizen of the kingdom will, in love, seek to make it right. That's the core message of verse 23 and 24. It, it, the message of, of, of confession of wrongdoing to another person and asking for forgiveness. That's what Jesus is teaching. That's the way of the kingdom. That is how relationships are reconciled. I don't know how strongly Jesus could say this. He literally says that it is actually a, a more important to God that you reconcile and forgive each other than to worship him. That's pretty strong. 
That's what I hear him saying when he says, you leave your gift at the altar. So how do you do that? As a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, how do you go and reconcile with someone? There are some things that need to happen to reconcile. And just very quickly, um, it's worth putting these up because they're, they're always relevant. If you have wronged someone, pretty much you need to do these bullet points you see on the screen. You need to give an honest confession of the wrong that was done. And you need to do it in such a way that you are not defensive, meaning you don't excuse what you've done. You don't make up a self-justification. You don't use words like if or maybe or but. You confess what you've done. And it's important to recognize the harm that was caused. I hurt you, and I know how that felt. It's important to accept consequences. How do I make it right? How can I mend this relationship? How can I show you that I do care for you? And it's important to repent. To ask for forgiveness without repentance is not asking for forgiveness. Repentance is a changed behavior. It's stopping what has caused the harm. And finally, there is the asking of forgiveness. That, in a nutshell, is how we go about seeking re reconciliation. So these are the things that the people of God do in doing this, reconciling. We stop the creation of anger. Instead of raka, criticism, we treat others with respect and value. Instead of moros, contempt, we seek to encourage others. In this regard, I think Paul describes our citizenship of the kingdom well, where he says in Colossians chapter 3, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, citizens of the kingdom, clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Going back to our passage, let's read on. In verses 25 and 26, we are told very clearly to do this reconciliation as soon as possible. ASAP, immediately, do not pause, do not wait for tomorrow, do it now. Come to terms quickly with your accuser. We are going with him to court, at least your accuser hand you over to the judge, and your judge to the guard, and put you in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you paid the last penny. In terms of conflict, there is great wisdom here. The sooner one reconciles, the easier and more possible that reconciliation is. If grievances become entrenched and battle lines are drawn, it becomes very hard to reconcile. I think we all know this from our own personal experiences. Um, let's use marriage as an example. In a marriage, the sooner you deal with problems and hurts and wounds, as hard as it may be to do so, the more likely peace and healing can happen. But if you let things go and criticism turns into contempt and then into defensiveness and then into stonewalling, you're nearing the end of a relationship. And so as Jesus' instructions, come to terms quickly. Leave your gift at the, your altar. Go and be reconciled. Now that's my sermon for our passage. But I want to take one more step. Looking at our passage today, Jesus invokes some really interesting imagery in talking about these words and how we communicate and how we treat each other. In the first set of verses, he evokes the imagery of judgment and hell. In the second set, he evokes the imagery of worship and reconciliation. And in the third set, he invokes the imagery of the accuser and prison. To me, seeing this imagery that he is using it tells me that he's not just talking about our horizontal 
relationships with each other, with other people. But there's also, a, a, he's communicating about our relationship with God, our vertical relationship. We are told by Jesus very clearly that if we hold our brother in contempt, thinking of him as having no value, then our destiny is hell. Well, how much more so? How much more so if we think of him, of Jesus, in the same way? How much more so if we think or treat Jesus with contempt? We are liable to hell. And dropping down to verse 25 and 26. In the same fashion, we are told that if we are under judgment and stand accused, the very best thing we can do is to come to terms quickly before it's too late. If this is wise for us regarding each other, how much wiser it is regarding the Lord. Outside of Christ, we all stand under judgment. And the day of judgment is coming Therefore, Jesus says, come to terms quickly before it's too late. And there in the middle, we have worship and reconciliation. So how do you come to terms with Jesus? Well, verse 23 and 24 tell us how. Just like the man at the altar who leaves his gifts to go and be reconciled with his brother, how much more are we to go and be reconciled with the Lord? How does it happen? Well, it goes something like this. Confess and repent of your sin. Pray something like this. Lord Jesus, I have wronged you. I have sinned. I have fallen short of your glory. I have done and said what I should not have done and said, and I have not done and said what I should have. Lord, I have sinned, and I repent, and I seek to walk the way of your kingdom. And through faith, to trust him with for your forgiveness. Lord, I trust you. Thank you for dying for my sins. Thank you for giving me. Thank you for forgiving me according to your word. Thank you for giving me your spirit. I ask that you strengthen my faith today and the days to come. Amen. And it's when we are reconciled to him, citizens of his kingdom, that he lives in us through his spirit. And it is by his spirit in us that our hearts become changed. I, I appreciate John Gottman. I, I do use his four horsemen of apocalypse of how not to communicate with people. I think it's very helpful. But he doesn't have a solution to the four horsemen. His solution are techniques. Don't communicate like this. Communicate like this instead. But we all know that if in the heart there is pride and selfishness and arrogance, it doesn't matter what technique I'm going to use. It's going to come out of me. Well, Jesus does not offer us a technique. He offers us a changed heart, a new heart that brings us into fellowship with him. So, as citizens of the kingdom, with this changed heart, instead of criticism, let us practice forgiveness. That's the changed heart. Instead of contempt, let us practice humility. That's the changed heart. Instead of defensiveness, let us practice confession. Instead of stonewalling, disengaging, not being a part, let us practice compassion, sharing in where they're suffering, sharing in what they're going through. This is what it looks like to be a citizen of the kingdom. I'd like to close with the passage that Courtney read earlier in the service, Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 4. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should not look only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Praise be to God. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray.
Gracious Father, I thank you for this morning. And we are in a world right now where it feels like our worldly culture, our Western culture, our American culture is fragmenting and disintegrating and there's fear and, 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 and battles and wars. But Lord, um, we are reminded by your word that we, we march to a different drum, that we are called to a different culture, that we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And that is who we are. That's the culture that shapes us, Father. And so as we heard today and as we journey on into this Sermon on the Mount, may we be confronted by the kingdom's culture and may that culture become ours. We thank you, Father, in Christ's name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to stand for our closing song. Only trust him. It is a song of invitation. You're invited to respond. Um, coming forward with by prayer. Um, a time of, of, of wanting to make it known to us. That could be part of New Baptist Church. But most importantly, I, I voice those prayers of confession and faith and trust and assurance. If you prayed those prayers, if you accepted Christ today, I would love to know that. I would love for you to walk on the path that leads to life in Jesus Christ. Please make that known to us or to myself afterwards. Um, let's sing together, only trust him. Page 330. to introduce to you Jeff and Kim Day. I'm going to hand the mic to Jeff here. Good morning, Jeff and Kim. Uh, we've attended here for some time now, but uh, grew up in Christian home, been Christians, saved, baptized back when we were young teenagers, been married for some time now, and we knew as our family got older and we had grandkids, and we did attend a church over in Chesapeake for some 30-some years. But looking for a home, felt so welcome here, and uh, we just want to thank each and every one of you, and we're looking for mem membership. Amen. So I invite you after the service to come and greet them as you go out. Let's welcome Jeff and Kim. Will you pray with me? Gracious Father, I, I thank you for this morning. And Lord, I, I do again ask, you know, may we have courage to in 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 
come under your words, to allow these words of Jesus to, to shape and, and, and change us, Lord. And I'm so grateful that though we may feel like we have failed or fallen short or stand guilty, I'm so grateful that we can confess our sin to you and be forgiven, Lord. You have the antidote for sin and shame, Father. And, and Lord, may we, because of that forgiveness, have boldness in approaching you, Lord. May we have boldness in approaching your throne through Jesus Christ. I thank you, Father, for this morning. I ask your hand upon um, those who are here today. May your spirit equip them and empower them and draw them into your kingdom, Father. I thank you for Jeff and Kim this morning as well, Lord. We give you great praise in Christ's name. Amen. Well, Jill.